Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 17, and this is what it says. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it happened that as he was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners came and joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax gatherers and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples did not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts on a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Pray with me. Jesus, this day is your day and grant that this day that there might be space enough, space enough where we experience your presence. Know and follow. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lee Strobel tells a story about a time when he was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. He was covering the criminal courts and he received a tip that uh, one of the gang members, actually is one of the gang leaders of a particularly notorious gang, that he was turning himself in. Well, that wasn't so much the story that Lee was interested in. What made it a story was he was turning himself in because he had become a Christian. That he had invited Jesus into his life and that meant he couldn't go on living the same way that he had. Well, Lee Strobel was an atheist and he was certain that people couldn't change like that and it certainly wasn't God even if they could. So he began to question the detectives who worked with the, and investigated the, the gang, gangs around Chicago. They described this man, Ron Bronski, as a piece of garbage. They said that he was totally without scruples, that he was a sociopath, the worst of the worst. They had an encyclopedia full of of, of crimes that he'd committed, crimes that he had served time for and knew that he would continue doing again and again. That at this particular time, there was a warrant out for him because he had shot a, 
a rival gang member in the back as he was running away. Well, Lee Strobel was sure that, that Ron Bronsky wasn't just a fraud, that he was a coward as well. So then he began to interview the church where Ron Bronsky had become a Christian and where he had been for years before he turned himself in. Well, the pastor there didn't describe him as a piece of garbage at all. Instead, the pastor there said he is one of the most beautiful, loving people I know. He said that he not only goes to visit the sick, but he prays with them as well, and he helps out kids that are having a hard time. The pastor went on to say that, that Ron Bronsky knew his life was reconciled with God, but it wasn't reconciled with the state of Illinois. So he drove back to Chicago and turned himself in for that outstanding warrant. Well, while he was in prison waiting for trial, he got to know several of the the guards there in prison, they testified at his trial that Ron Bronsky was a changed man. Not only that, but the prosecutor prosecuting the case testified on his behalf, said that he was a changed man. After interviewing the Ron Bronsky, the, the judge took the advice of the, of the prosecutor and of the, the, the guards and was convinced that Ron Bronsky was a changed man. Ron Bronsky spent the rest of his life following Jesus Christ and helping kids who who were troubled, kids who were in danger of falling into gangs. He spent the rest of his life serving Jesus Christ. Well, it's a, a story that for over 2,000 years has been told again and again and again and again. A story of, I was angry. I was bitter. I was brokenhearted. I was afraid. I was controlled by what others thought of me. But then, Jesus. It's the same story that, that Matthew tells right here. That He was a tax collector. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was feared. He was unscrupulous. And he was miserable. But then, but then, Jesus called him out of the tax office. That he he couldn't stay a changed man and stay in the same place. That it required change. And Jesus calls him out of the tax office to follow him. Jesus goes on to to talk about it in a parable. That it's, it's a new patch that requires a new garment. That it's new wine that requires new skins. That it's the new creation that requires a, a new life following Jesus. And can't sit in the old tax office anymore. It makes no sense to claim a a new life and a new creation and still be in the same place. Jesus offers a life that makes sense, and that's what I want to talk about this morning, a life that makes sense, a life that has a sense of healing and wholeness. That's the first thing that I want to talk about. In verse 12, Jesus says, it is not those who are healthy but who need a physician, but those who are ill. It's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are ill. A forest ranger in Wales wrote an article about the trails where he was a ranger. That in his park there were trails that had beautiful trees, wildlife, hills, gorgeous place. And he said that most often the question that people ask wasn't, where do the trails go, that most often the question wasn't how long are the trails or will we need bug spray to hike in this park. The most frequently asked question was, excuse me, where does the trail start? And the trail, the trail for healing and wholeness starts with the word repentance. Repentance. The first word John the Baptist of John the Baptist's message in Matthew 3 1 was repent. 
The first word in Jesus' message in Matthew 4, 14 was repent. The first words for the disciple in preaching ministry in Mark chapter 6, verse 12 was repent. That we, we can't stay where we are and follow Jesus at the same time. That the word repent is, is a Greek word, metanoia, and it means to, to change the mind, change the heart, change the attitude. And it starts with a great physician who has power to heal when we don't have that power. That has the power to make strong in the broken places when we don't have that power. It's what Jesus did on the cross. He took the anger. He took the bitterness. He took the broken heart. He took the fear, and he took all that controls us, and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all. That's what he did for you and for me, that we might follow, follow him in a life that makes sense, a life that's changed, a new creation. It's why he came. It's why he's the great physician, and we are not. It's a life that makes sense and has a sense of, of healing and wholeness. But not only healing and wholeness, a sense of compassion. Verse 13, Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. What a, what a strange thing to put those two words together, compassion and sacrifice. Usually if I desire compassion, the opposite would be I require compassion and not payback. Or I desire compassion and not vengeance. Or I desire compassion and not anger or bitterness or so many other things. But he says, I com desire compassion and not sacrifice. Why is that? It's because compassion, compassion has to do with the position of the heart. A position of the heart. And he was talking to religious people. Religious people who were looking for some kind of return on their investment. And that to, the sacrifice to God might mean a return of investment of what, what can God give me? How can God serve me? Compassion doesn't have to be, doesn't, isn't about me being the center. Compassion is an outward view that is how do I serve others? How do I look to what their needs are? How do I help them and not help me? How do I share their burden. Dutch governor general of Java was once complaining to, to a companion about how the people of Java wanted the Dutch to go, wanted them to leave. And he was complaining because he said, think of all the schools that we've built. We've built hospitals. We've eliminated disease. We've built roads. We've built railroads. We've introduced industry. And yet they want us to go. Why? Can you tell me why they want us to go? And that's when his companion said, I'm afraid it's because you've never had the right look in the eye when you spoke to them. Jesus changes the position of the heart and it can be seen in the eye. We may know that people matter to God, but do they matter to us? Do they matter by the way that we speak to them? The way we, we look at them. That Jesus, Jesus can, can transform a heart, can transform an eye. The way that we, we look at the world around us. He creates in us a life that makes sense. And compassions our, and, 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 and positions our heart toward compassion of others and not just what can we get. It's a life that makes sense. It has a sense of compassion. And not only a sense of compassion, the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is a sense of joy. It's in verse 14. The, the disciples of John came to Jesus and said, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? In order, in, in other words, we're being very religious, very adult-like here. We're doing all the things that we should do to be religious, but you and your disciples are acting like it's a party. 
You're acting like it's a, a, a wedding feast. And it's appropriate because a wedding feast was the highest celebration that an individual might know in the ancient world. It included a party that led to the day of the wedding, and days after the wedding, that party continued. That during the wedding, it was the bride and groom put on a robe and a crown. They were considered king, and their word was law. They're among those who loved and cared for them. It was a time of great joy. Jesus was criticized for not looking religious enough. His disciples were criticized for not looking religious enough. Comedian Paul Jensen tells a story about he and his son, four years old, they were walking, taking a a short walk, and his his son looked down and found a small rubber, rubber ball. It was the kind of rubber ball that you might find in a gumball machine, something like that. And, and his son said, Dad, can I keep it? Paul Jensen said, sure. That's when his son looked at him and said, this is the best day ever. And that's when Paul Jensen responded. And at that moment, I hated everything about being an adult. So often we think that being adult means being serious, rather than embracing the joy that Jesus has come to to offer you and, and me. It's a joy that He offers through His resurrection. It doesn't depend on the circumstances. It doesn't depend on the, the amount of stuff. It doesn't even depend on whether there's a pandemic or not. It's a joy that's given through the risen Christ. And it's the Apostle Paul who knows this joy because he's writing to a church that he cares very much about, a church in Philippi. Paul, in writing to build up this church, he's writing from prison. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Always. He's writing from prison. He knows what it's like to have horrible circumstances around him. And yet he calls. He calls us to to a life that makes sense, that's only possible through the, the spirit of the risen Christ, that he lives his life through us and we know his joy. Catholic priest Johannes Tauler tells a story about meeting a poor man as he passed by him on the road. One day he turned to the man and he said, God give you a good day, my friend. The poor man answers, I thank God I never have a bad day. Tauler said, well, God give you a happy life, my friend. And the poor man said, I thank God I'm I'm never unhappy. Never unhappy? Tyler said, what do you mean? He said, well, when it is sunshine, I thank God. When it rains, I thank God. When I have plenty, I thank God. And when I'm hungry, I thank God. And since God's will is my will, and whatever pleases God pleases me, why should I say that I am unhappy when I'm not? Tyler looked on him with awe and said, who are you? To which the poor man replied, I'm a king. A king? Where's your kingdom? The poor man smiled and said, in my heart. Jesus Christ, he came to usher in a new creation, a new kingdom. The kingdom, it's it's all around. It's in our hearts. And the risen Christ gives us the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and mouths to see that will give him praise, that will give him thanks, mouths that will express the joy as he lives his life through us. It's a life that makes sense. It's a life that has a deep sense of joy that we can't get anywhere else other than the risen Christ. His name is Jesus. And he came that we might have a a life that has a sense of healing and wholeness. It starts with repentance. We don't have 
power enough to, to change our minds, to, to change our will on our own. For some small things, maybe so. But for life, no. It requires His strength. It's the strength that He gave when He rose from the grave to live His life through you and me. This morning, you may never have, have invited Jesus into your heart, that you've never started the trail with a repentance and ask Him to help change your will, change your mind. I would like to invite you to, to pray with me this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, you give power that we don't have. Power, not just 2,000 years ago, but that power is available this day. Power enough to turn to you and repent. To ask your help to change our will, to change our mind. To ask for your help for a life that makes sense and gives in us a, a sense of compassion because the position of our hearts, it's been changed. And what we see, we see people differently with compassion and not what they might do for us and not what you might do for us. Lord, that we see the world differently. There are the eyes of joy that give praise, thanks. Create in us a new heart, O oh God, that we might give back to you a heart that's changed. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.